So when I started in Ryerson in 2005, jobs like Uber driver or iOS or a Apple developers or even drone operators didn't exist. So what you, what you have to realize is what new jobs will be created by the time you graduate. So for some of you, you might be graduating you know, in one year, but what about in four years? Or what about in 10 years? What new jobs will be existing at that time? You see, in half of the S&P 500, which is some of the largest corporations, half of them will be replaced in 10 years. So the question is, since 65% of the jobs for the next generation doesn't exist today, so if you are in L primary school, which you know, none of you guys are, but if you are starting in primary school, by the time you graduate, 65% of your jobs doesn't even exist yet. So if you think about it from that point of view, the other perspective is to understand which industries will rise, and at the same time, what jobs will be eliminated. So the key question is, what can you do? I want to tell you a story about cell phones. More particularly, Nokia. Has anyone had this Nokia phone before? Yeah, there we go. So, Nokia is obviously a telecom company. And years ago, what they did was at the height of Nokia, they were, they were worth $140 billion. And what they ended up doing is they ended up acquiring or buying a company called Navtech. So Navtech is a company that makes road sensors. Road sensors are basically physical assets that you place on a road to measure data, whether it's traffic and other conditions. So they thought, Nokia and Navtech thought that in order to grow in this market, you need to have physical assets to understand the data, to find out what's happening with the traffic, if there's construction, if there's delays, they thought you need to have physical assets. But on the other hand, on the other side of the world, there's a company called Waze. So what Waze did is they played a different game entirely. So at that point, what they, what they used was they used cell phones. They used cell phones that people had all around to create resources and information collectively from a lot of people. So, what Nokia and Navtech's mindset is to, to take you back to where they were is to understand our own mindset. So typically, if you look at your mind, there are things that you know you know. So for a lot of you, you know how to build a building or you know how to draw and design a building. You might know the foundation or you might know how to calculate the terminal value. That's what you know you know. There is also what you know you don't know. So, this could be something like brain surgery. You might, you know that there is such thing as brain surgery, but you're not gonna try and do brain surgery, or at least I hope not. Right, so that's what you know you don't know. Here's the third element, which is what you don't know you don't know. And that is your blind spots. And this is exactly what happened with Nokia and Navtech. They played the game that they knew. This is what they were used to. So what ended up happening is survivorship bias. So survivorship bias is basically thinking that what worked before will work now. It's like a gambler who plays poker and they realize that they won that hand is because they were wearing a special watch. So the next game they're gonna wear that same watch again. And that's exactly what happened with Nokia. So while Nokia was stuck on building physical assets on a road and bringing it up, Waze, on the other hand, was able to scale exponentially with much, much less cost. So, as a result, what ended up happening is 
eventually, remember, Nokia at a type was 140 million and bought NAFTA for around 8 billion. Several years later, Nokia got bought out for around that same price by Microsoft. So, to understand what happened, we need to rewind back and understand how we got here. We need to understand the status quo. And the status quo is the way things are. The way things used to be, the way things are, and the way things are going to be. So if we rewind the clock back to the 1400, the status quo was that if you wanted to know how to read or write, there was only a handful of people who had access to the books, or they were able to read. So at that point, Johannes Gutenberg, what he did was he created the printing press. And what that created was that changed the imbalance of power, of information, and knowledge. So people weren't resorting to having kings who were able to read and pass the information. Now they can read for themselves. And that single moment changed how power and information resources for everyone. And this was in the 1400s, right? Now imagine what we're living in today. We have 3D bio printing, where you can print hearts, you can print human cartilage, like ears and nose, with 3D printing. You can even 3D print houses. Or you can drive in a self-driving car. Or we have artificial intelligence and robotics. You see, the amount of changes that we are living in right now is drastically increasing at an exponential rate. And with all of this change, with all of this change, what you have to realize is there is a change in the status quo. And when there is a change in the status quo, there is a change in resources. And there is a change in power. And as this happens, you have to realize that when there is a change, that partnership fails. Now what do I mean by partnership? Partnership is basically you and your friend, or you and your client. If you're working as an architect, it's you and your client. If your client doesn't need you anymore, they're going to go somewhere else. When the status quo changes, partnership fails. And one of the recent examples of this is Toys R Us. You see, in 1970s, when Toys R Us came out, came out, it was a category killer. So that means it dominated one category, and that was toys. But around 2000, they realized, okay, this whole online purchase is happening, but we're not, we're, we don't have anything to sell online. So what they did is they partnered with Toys R Us. So in essence, what ended up happening is if you bought on Toys R Us online, you're essentially buying on the Amazon.com page. Again, think, think back to what Toys R Us knew. They knew what they knew, and that's what the status quo was. So at that point, Toys R Us realized that something's weird after a few years. You see, on the other side, what ended up happening was Amazon, they were able to use other partners and not really rely on Toys R Us. So initially, when, when Amazon and Toys R Us started, they, were, they needed each other. That was the status quo. We need each other to grow. But then eventually, Amazon realized they can go to a whole bunch of other people to sell more toys. The status quo changed. And as a result, their partnership failed. And of course, we now know about Toys R Us closing. And it's only in, it's only in 2017, late 2017 and early this year, 2018, that, uh, that Toys R Us started to realize this. You see, the competition was based on what they knew for Toys R Us. So when it comes to competition, there are three different types of competition. There is direct, indirect, and replacement. So let's just say we're talking about direct. If you, if you have Coke, your direct competition is Pepsi. 
indirect is if you have coke, your competition is sparkling water. Or the last one, replacement, if you have coke, your competition is Starbucks or Bulldog Coffee or something else. But to my research, what I found out there is actually a fourth type of competition. And that's what I call dark horse competitors. You see, dark horse competitors can come out of nowhere and they can go in any one of these situations. So take a look at a grocery store. Across the street, there is Metro, before it used to be called Dominion. So in Metro, if you ask them 10 years ago, hey, is a bookstore your competitor? A bookstore? No, they sell books. We sell groceries. They're not my competitor. But then what ends up happening is a bookstore ends up getting so large selling online that they open Amazon Go. And not only that, they, they create and bought by one of the largest grocery chains, Whole Foods, and they're able to deliver food in two hours. So they go from not being a competitor to being one of the number one threats for the companies. And the way that dark horse competitors work is similar to chess. Anyone ever play chess? Anyone play chess? So when, when you play chess, the bishop, or pardon me, the rook, what ends up happening is, and that's what I like to call the dark knight, what ends up happening is it's the only piece that can actually hop over other pieces. It can go forward or backward. And similar way, dark horse competitors are able to do that. They're able to go from not being in the industry or not being a direct competitor, being head first in line with you. And these dark horse competitors are not only for external for our companies, but it can also be internal. It can also be employees within companies. So the next element of understanding dark horse is an ancient Chinese word called Ling Qi. Ling Qi basically means a death by a thousand paper cuts. Think about that, a death by a thousand paper cuts, a slow bleeding over time. You see, a lot of these large companies, what they end up doing is they, re they, they don't think that they're being impacted by someone else until it's too late. Take a look at a large company like FedEx. Here is a company website where almost every single button is being targeted by another startup. This is for Honeywell. You see Nest. This is for Starwood Hotels. Every single button is being targeted by someone else. There is no way you as a larger corporation can tackle all of it by doing what you used to do. Again, it's thinking about survivorship bias. Because we're living in a new status quo, and in order for you to actually impact and grow for the future, this is what you need to do, which is change in order to avoid the link chi. So the question comes, which is, what can you do about it? Well, here's what you can do. You need to be an ant, and you need to think like Genghis Khan. What do I mean by ant? Why do you need to be like an ant? Well, to give you a perspective, take a look at a typical organization. Whether it's here at the university or somewhere else, typically you have the person at the top and you have the different layers going all the way down. So if you are one of the frontman workers, if you wanted to get an idea across, you have to go up the food chain. And at any one of those points, if someone re rejects your idea, it gets thrown out. And you think about the time delay for all of this, what will end up happening is by the time you get up there, it will be too late. So what's the opposite of having a command-like structure? And that is being flat, flat like an ant. So to, to help you understand how ants work and how they communicate, this is a diagram, a very complicated diagram, of how ants work and how they move around. So they go around in a random fashion. And the way that ants communicate is by their antennas. 
they talk using their antennas. So as they're trying to find food, they keep on traveling until they find food, or at least one of them does. And when they do, they go back and they leave a trail. And this trail is so for anyone who's walking across, hey, Jim found food, let's follow this. So this keeps on going until more and more people go and the food gets all depleted. And at that point, the trail stops and then the hunting begins again. This decentralized fashion allows them to adapt to any situation. It's like a swarm of birds flying in the sky as well. They can adapt, mold, in essence, be fluid. So for organizations to survive, that's what they need to do. Now, by being an ant, you can improve your speed. But going back, what did I mean by Genghis Khan? You see, Genghis Khan was the ruler at one point of one of the largest empires in the world. Huge, long stretch from Europe to the oceans. And to think about for his organization or his empire to grow, to push more west, westwards towards Europe, he realized that he needed to not only take, take care of what's inside the organization, but also what's outside. So what he did is he created a war chest. He focused on not what's here right now, but also what's in the future. And for him, he realized that in order to grow, this is the best way to take care of the empire. Because had he just left for Europe and tried to conquer there without taking care of the inner turmoil within his Karakoram or his inner capital, then everything would crumble. At the same time, if he just focused internal, everything else would be shrunken in. So he needs to do inside and outside. Similarly, organizations need to focus on what's core, what are they actually doing, and what's disruptive work. You know, whether you're looking at blockchain or artificial intelligence, that's what they need to do. And typically, that's what's, what's taught of for a lot of organizations, that there are two. But in my research, there's another one which I discovered, which is called Aram, which is in the middle zone. And this is where dark horse companies survive. They can come out of nowhere, but it's also by being around. And if you look at this, this is how it looks like, because for disruptive companies or ideas, they don't pay dividends right now. So if you're working on something, let's just say, using artificial intelligence or using a code to build a building, it's, not, it's going to take you some time. Whereas if you're focusing on what you're doing right now, that's going to pay dividends right away. And this is for a telephone company, such as Ericsson. Now, that is search. So we have two things, speed and search. Speed, focusing, thinking like an ant, and search, thinking like Genghis Khan. And this allows you to be fluid, but it won't work. The reason why it won't work as long as you want to change, it's the same reason why Firestone tires had the radial tire technology and they were able to lead the market, but they didn't. It's the same reason why Blockbuster failed, even though they knew about Netflix. And it's the same reason Toys R Us failed. And there are two reasons why. One is time launching something at the right time. If you launch too early, like Bill Gates did, with the first version of the iPad, quote unquote, the tablet PC, it was too early into the market. It's gonna fail. And of course, if you launch too late, as we've seen, it'll fail as well. So one is time, the other element is culture. Now what do I mean by culture? Culture is taking a look at understanding within your own organization and here's a quote from the Toys R Us CEO. Some organizations realize that they need to change. It took us a while. Think about it. They, they knew about online back in 2000, yet they chose not to focus on it. And the reason why the culture 
doesn't get impacted is to think about your immune system. So this little guy is your immune system. And the way he works is he tries to fight off, fight off bad guys called antigens. So anytime you, there are bad antigens, your immune system fights it off. Now when there are good antigens, your immune system recognizes it. It recognizes it because your body releases antigens that the immune system realizes. However, let's just say you need a new lung, a new lung transplant, right? So what ends up happening is, you put a new lung in your body and it releases antigens. But, what ends up happening is your immune system doesn't recognize that it's here to help you. It actually thinks, oh, it's a foreign, it's a foreign body, let's attack it. It doesn't trust it. Because that's what it's used to. Even though your lung is meant to be good for you, your immune system tries to attack it. And it doesn't matter what you say, that's what's going to happen. So, to understand that, we need to understand organ rejection. So with the immune system, what ends up happening is with your organ rejection, if you put a new lung or a kidney, what happens is there are three different avenues. One is acute, so it happens immediately. Two is happens over some time. And third, chronic, which happens after a long period of time. In the same way that we have organ rejection, we also have idea rejection. So let's just say if you work at a company or you want to take an idea to a professor or someone else, you take an idea, it gets shut down right away. So that is acute. Because they're not used to the new status quo. Because when you start challenging and changing things, they get nervous. Because again, they don't know any better. They think that they're trying to help or protect the new environment or keep the same environment successful based on what they already know. So, that is the idea of re rejection. And if you're working in a larger cor corporation, what ends up happening is you have different, multiple layers that you have to go through. So, here's a great quote from Upton St. Clair, which is, it's difficult to get a man to understand something which is just entails him, on him not understanding it. Imagine you're telling someone early on who, when, when all the architecture firms used to draw by hand, it's like, hey, let's switch to AutoCAD. They're going to be like, what? No. My job, I have to take care of all this paperwork. I am the head pencil sharpener, or whatever it is. That was before. Now, imagine you're telling someone to switch from AutoCAD to Revit. And be like, what? No, 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 we've, we've always been doing it this way. What do you mean? I'm the head person who's coordinating all these CAD documents. <coughs> I don't want to switch to something else. And part of the reason is they're afraid, or it also depends on who they are. If you're about to retire in five years out, you don't want to change. You just want to get your retirement check at the end. Meanwhile, when a lot of a lot of new entrants to the jobs, but you guys want to create change, and when you do, you're met with all this resistance, and that is the tough thing to go, to overcome. Because you have to realize that there is the comfort zone, and there is where disruption and innovation happens. So, how do you overcome it? Long word, immunosuppressive medicine, which basically means you are trying to reduce your immune system. And the way to do that is, one, to understand that to align your leadership with your goals. And sometimes that's easy. So when you're aligning your leadership with the goals, it could be as simple as, hey, let's just switch to Revit, or hey, let's just use this 3D CAD software. And when that happens, you have to drive up change. Sometimes this is easy. So a, a friend of mine who works in a large cell phone company, he was able to do that to talk and go up the chain and create a new business unit within telecom here in Toronto. And as a result, they were not only able to create a new business unit, but for deliveries, they were also able to improve the deliveries itself. Now, that was one. There are four other 
where I'm not going to get into it in my book, but the key thing to keep in mind is here's a quote from the CEO of Nokia at the time that Nokia was being taken over. We didn't do anything wrong, but somehow we lost. Understand that mindset. We didn't do anything wrong. They thought every single thing that they were doing was right. It's because they were playing with the old status quo, the old game. They were thinking what they knew was right without understanding and realizing the new status quo.